my family has requested some adorable animal portraits for their wall. I've already drawn some, but the problem is is that my inkjet printer is a little flat. Ha, in color, but also dimensionally speaking. Over my shoulder, I have a 3D printer, and I'm wondering if I can take the SVG vector graphics files and turn them into something with depth that might look cool on a wall. You know, and while we're at it, because we're 3D printing this, we might as well 3D print the picture in a frame with a hole for like a nail or something. The cool thing about vector graphics is that rather than using pixels to define an image, they use curves and coordinates. And curves and coordinates sound dangerously 3D printable. To understand how this SVG file works, there are really only three things I think you need to know. One is paths, two is groups, and three are matrices. And don't worry, we won't get too mathy, but they're just too cool to skip over. To start, let's take a look at paths. Now, this might just look like a jumble of letters and numbers, but if we take a deeper look, they actually make a lot of sense. You see, SVG paths are defined with commands. Each command starts with a single letter and then is preceded by numbers. If we look at our SVG, for example, we see M and C. Let's take a closer look at what those mean. The M command is really simple. It just means move to. Uh, and in this case, it defines the start of a curve. The C command, you may have guessed this, stands for curve, specifically Bezier curves. And these come with three coordinates. Two of them are control points, and if you've ever used in vector graphics software like Illustrator or Affinity, you will have seen these before. And the last one is the end point. Now that we've demystified paths, let's talk about groups. Really quickly, groups are exactly what they sound like. They are just an arbitrary grouping of paths in this case. Uh, when you export a file from a program like Affinity, typically layers become groups, and you can see that in the file here. Okay, now let's talk about that matrix. These matrices are transformation matrices, and they're a really clever way of encoding scale, rotation, and translation. How they work is pretty cool. Under the hood, a transformation matrix creates an alternative coordinate frame. So to think about this in an example, if we were to draw a rectangle on a standard Cartesian coordinate grid, it might look like this. Now, say I want to transform that rectangle by scaling it up horizontally and rotating it 45 degrees. Instead, let's just transform the coordinate space it's sitting on. So let's take that coordinate space, shift it down, scale it up horizontally, and rotate it 45 degrees. Now all we have to do is redraw our square at the exact same spot, and voila, it's transformed. The advantage to this technique is it enables us to apply transformations at a group level, or a layer level if we're thinking in terms of our vector editor. When we select a layer, a layer might contain multiple shapes and paths, and this enables us to scale them all in the same way. Pretty neat. Now that we understand a little bit about how those files work, let's pop over to Blender, which supports importing SVGs natively, and see what our file looks like in 3D. All right, everything's flat and kind of glitching out. This glitching is happening because two planes are on the exact same Z height, and so the computer isn't sure which color it's supposed to draw first. In an SVG, this is simple. You just draw in the order that they're defined. But in three-dimensional space, it's a little bit more complicated. There aren't layers. So let's create the layers simply by moving them up and down. All right, now that we've physically sorted the layers by moving them up and down, let's convert them from curves to meshes. The difference is a mesh, rather than being a mathematical definition of a curve, is actually just a bunch of vertices. So it, it, we're losing some detail here. We're going from a smooth curve to one with flat edges, but enough of them that it still mostly looks smooth. But critically, this enables us to take our 2D curve and make it 3D. So 
So as you can see, this is a bit of a manual process, but using what we learned about SVGs earlier in the video, I think I might be able to write some software to automate this. Leave a comment below if that's something you'd be interested in. So now I'm exploring adding things that are not in the SVG file. I only have four colors to work with, and so this white background, I wanted to make it appear somewhat transparent. To do that, I'm trying to make a hatched effect. Uh, we'll see how it turns out in the final print. To further personalize it, let's throw in a name and maybe add some stars in the background for a little extra pizzazz. Uh, thanks to my wife for that suggestion. The last step is just to put a hole in the back here so that we can hang it on the wall. Uh, to do that, I'm just gonna emulate a shape I've seen on a bunch of other frames, a little cylinder with a, a notch above it so that the body of the screw or nail can slide upwards and hold it securely. Heading over to the slicer now, I've exported each color as its own object so that I can easily assign a filament to it. Other than that, only some very light customization here. I changed the infill to cubic so that it's mostly hollow, and I tried to create a little purge volume off on the left so that I could use more of the surface area. Honestly, the slicer settings aren't perfect, but running out of time here, so good enough for now. Let's see how it turns out. Here it is. I think this looks pretty sweet. It's got nice depth. The colors look pretty awesome. I think the uh, hanger hole will work really well. If there was anything I would change about it, it's this chin. And not the chin of the graphic, but actually that you can see the underline of the body of the fox through the chin because there's only a few layers of white. A uh, couple problems this points out. The main one is that why is the outline even needing to be rendered underneath the chin when it's inside the object? Uh, this is a mistake I made because I imported all of these shapes as unique parts, but what I should have done is combined them into a single mesh first and then uh, painted directly on that in Bamboo Studio. I think that would have made for a much more efficient print and prevented all of the colors in layers that aren't even visible. Next time.